Well, good day, you all. And, um, it's good to see you all here on this beautiful day. And uh, that was a lovely rendition of Rebecca's official biography. But I just want to share three things you may not know about Rebecca that don't make it into the very impressive uh, and kind of daunting list of accomplishments that she has. Um, the first is that uh, she was a cheerleader in high school. <laughs> and this was because the school had compulsory sport and yes. she has a morbid fear of round projectiles. <laughs> That's true. Um, she is accused of selling out to Cheetos. And we might explain that later. <laughs> we, will, we will circle back, I hope, to all of these intriguing facts. Oh but the third is that she knows how to say the garden has high fences around it in Hungarian, which is way more difficult than I would ever have imagined. So we're going to get back to all these things. Um, but before we start, I, I, I want to say that I have to be the 10,000th interviewer to say, I have some questions for yeah. you. <laughs> I knew when we settled on that title, it's like you're, you're, you brace yourself for yeah. every interview, but it's, it's, it I was just a choice. Had, I just had to spit that out. <laughs> uh, but before we get to the new novel, I would like to, if it's okay with you, just explore, explore your journey to writing starting with your rich linguistic childhood. Yeah, yeah. Was, that's, my, my parents were both linguistics professors, um, which is a, grew up going to a lot of linguistics conferences in various university towns. Um, I was, you know, you say rich linguistics childhood, I was, I was not raised bilingual, which they very easily could have done, so it's not, not quite as rich in that way as you might think, but um, certainly was surrounded by uh, fascinating people. Uh, did, did your parents meet in Hungary or after they came? Uh, my, only my father is Hungarian, actually. Oh, okay. My mother's uh, American, and uh, they met in graduate school for uh -huh. linguistics, yeah. Uh -huh. um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting, I think, correlation. You know, they were both linguists. They're both also very talented, just amateur musicians, which I, th I think there's a lot in common there. My sister is a professional piano teacher. I'm a writer, and I think there's all, you know, all of that, the sound of language, um, certainly storytelling is, maybe, is a different category, but there's something with language and music and the ear for foreign languages that all goes together in a, in a nice way. And, and your grandmother was a novelist. Right, my father's mother in Hungary was a novelist, yeah. yeah. And there are 14 novels? Oh, 40. Four zero. Forty. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, she was incredibly prolific. Um, were they any good? I don't hear, okay, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> I don't know, because my Hungarian is not good enough to read them. Yeah. And um, I've read a few things, you know, shorter things by her in translation. This is one reason, we were talking, I'm, you know, constantly working on my Hungarian, and this is one reason I feel like this would be, she, um, she died when I was a baby, um, uh, relatively young, and this is the person in my family that, in some ways, I have the most in common with, and I have 40 books sitting there on my shelf, and they are in what happens to be the most difficult language in the world to learn, as if it's not your native language. Um, but just, it's a lifelong challenge. And I think, you know, if I'll, I'll get there, I'll, I'll write a memoir about the whole experience, I'll eventually read them. Um, but she, she was really highly regarded. She's, um, you know, maybe not, not in fashion right now, but people definitely, you mm -hmm. know, remember her name, knew who she was. And yeah. were, were the books published in Hungary or did they have to be smuggled out? Um, so most of them were published in Hungary and Hungarian, although she had a lot of censorship on her. Um, two manuscripts, at least, uh, she realized she couldn't publish during her lifetime. And so uh, my, you know, smuggled them out. One of them was but my, my mother, who was American, uh, traveled alone into communist Hungary in 1960, maybe, to meet alone her very intimidating future mother-in-law, um, who then gave her a manuscript to smuggle out of the country on the train. Um, and she, so this is, people wore girdles, and so she had these kind of very thin onion skin papers, and she strapped them around herself in this girdle. Um, 
and and got them, you know, and then uh, that book was finally published in the late 90s um, in Hungarian, which is where there would be interest, but after mm -hmm. uh, the communist government was gone. Um, but hell of a way to meet your future mother-in-law. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. just... Can we just circle back to that sentence that you were trying to master you told me yesterday? Oh, good God. Yeah, yeah. The problem is if I can remember the word for fence. Mm. But yeah, so, so here's the thing. Yeah. I'll, I'll say it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to muddle the word for fence, but it would be a kurul, a kert kurul, edge magash. No, I said I said um, harum magash. Kara something. It doesn't matter uh, about but, the yeah, Hungarian. Yeah, but, 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 but I'll tell you, I'll tell yeah. you in English, which is the interesting yeah. part. It's like, oh my, the... Oh, and I said it wrong. It, okay. If anyone speaks, there, there are no Hungarian speakers in the audience, are there? Okay, I said something wrong. But yeah, what I was explaining was, it's like, <laughs> if you, you know, if you're saying, if you said there's a, there's a fence around the garden, you could just say that basically, a, you know, basically say that. But if you're saying there's a fence around this garden, now I have to say, around, the, the around the garden around three tall fence stands because, because, you know, and now I said a number, so now everything's singular again, but also, and then, then one word changes because when you say, it, 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 the, the rules are so arcane and they're beautiful, um, but this is a language that developed just completely in isolation. Um, but I'm fascinated, I'm, I'm obsessed with it. I'm obsessed with learning it and it's just so hard. Yeah. yeah. And you have a few other things on. <laughs> a, few, a few other things going on. It is, you know, it's, it's Duolingo on my phone is a lot of it. Love the Duolingo. Um, and uh, uh, the great thing about Duolingo Hungarian is they haven't really developed the course, so they don't explain any of it. They just, there's no tips. There's no, like, it's just like, hey, figure this out. So, so to circle back to this novel, um, I want to go indirectly at it. Um, uh, actually, no, before we do, we, we've only done your childhood. I, I, I was really fascinated by something you said. You taught in Montessori school. I did, yeah. For a long time, right? 12 years, yeah, 12 years. elementary Montessori. And I was fascinated by what you said about what you learned from reading to those kids. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I say this a lot. That, um, the this, is, this was an incredible literary training and training in storytelling, which was just that, I, you know, half an hour at the end of every school day for 12 years um, was read aloud time. You know, I'm reading Charlotte's Web or The Westin Game or, or whatever it is. Um, it was an incredible education in when people might get bored or lost. You know, because you're reading, I, I think it could be very, you know, you're a writer, you're sitting alone in your office and you're imagining that everyone's going to be hanging on your every word and isn't that great. Um, the reality that you're faced with, if you are reading to children, is they start squirming around, someone's, you know, gets the craft scissors and now they're cutting their hair and they're, they're you know, um, you have instant visual feedback on what works um, and, you know, also where are they confused? Where are they, you know, where did we lose them? Um, it's something that I think I am a person, because I, I have ADHD, I'm someone with um, who thinks a lot about attention um, myself. I think I would already be very interested and, and keep, you know, kind of tuned in to what might get boring, where I might lose someone. But I cannot imagine a better training than this just, you know, it's, and it's not my words, so there's no offense taken um, when they're rolling around and, and you know, gla glazed over. But um, just you, you learn what are those moments and what could get someone hooked back in. I loved reading to my sons because it gave children's literature and YA, uh, there's a great appreciation of plot. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big fan of plot. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> me too. And in kids' literature, X is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And then Y happens, and X plus Y are ex exponentially more yeah. interesting. And the story yeah. goes on from that. And I get the sense that you're a person who appreciates plot. Very well. much, yeah. very much. Yeah, and it's, you know, I think there's great literary merit to plenty of books that are less plot driven or, or have much less traditional plot structures. Um, but my personal taste is um, I want to tell a story, I want to, to read a story, I want to have that propulsion of I need to turn one more page. Um, and that can be a very serious book at the same time. You can get at some really, you know, the, the medicine in that, in that spoonful of sugar can be there. Um, 
But I, and I, I really need both, because I will say I'm, I'm, my personal taste is also that I, I have a hard time reading something that was really just written with entertainment value in mind. Um, I, I think it's, it's great that it exists. Those are, I just, that's not my taste. Um, I, I want the page turner that is also making me really think of, or troubling me, or I find, you know, I've never read something quite like this before. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's, that's always, you know, I'm, I'm uh, I don't think I'll ever be tempted to write something that does not have a strong plot because I, I would not be interested in that. Well, all your novels have got incredibly propulsive Thank you. plot. And I loved this line from, um, it was a review of your first book, The Borrower. Mm. Uh, it strikes a nice balance between literary artistry and gripping storytelling. Oh, that's and I, nice. And I think that characterizes all your, all your books. And I think that, you know, um, so the literary artistry part of it, so after you, after you, what, what made you stop teaching? What was the... I'm just success as a, you know, my, my books were getting published. Right. Um, so I was, I was writing all along. I was writing, you know, uh, by about eighth or ninth grade, I wanted to be a writer. I was, I was writing constantly, um, was publishing short stories as I was teaching, was you know, finished my first novel. And I, I actually taught still part-time the year after my first novel came out. Um, but that's, that's a job, you know, you are in the classroom seven hours straight every day. That's not the kind of thing where you can take off to do a literary festival or, um, and, uh, and by that point I had two small children also. Um, so I, you know, I, it's also, I, you know, it's a job that I had energy for when I was young. Yeah. And God bless anyone who can keep up with young children in a classroom after the age of about 32. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. This heroic and yeah. incredibly skillful yeah. um, people who do that work. But what I've found with teaching, even with older, even teaching young adults, is is so you have to put so much energy oh, into it. Yeah. So, you know, to have any energy left over to write, I take my hat off. But when did yeah. you do Breadloaf? Uh, the Breadloaf, yeah, that's the, the graduate program at Breadloaf, which some people know for its writer's conference, which is also amazing. Um, that was summers. It's a summer program uh -huh. in English literature. Uh -huh. And so that fit, you know, I would teach elementary school during the year, do graduate school in the summer, repeat, and somewhere in there was also writing. Right. And, uh, and yeah. I have to say... Um, I first came across your work when I was editing Best American Short Stories oh, right, in 2011, yes. and I had the honor of being the fourth editor, guest editor for that series to choose one of your stories. Yes. Thank you. And Again. that was four in a row, Best American Short Stories, and there's only one person, I think, who can top that, and that was Irving Shaw. I believe that's right. so. It's it's tricky because um, you have to count. You have to start counting from when there was a guest editor. Back in yeah. the day when it was one editor, they'd choose their friends every time. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, well, we forget um, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think there maybe maybe two or three in, in that mm -hmm. era sense. But it was you know that was something that really made my career. You know, you're you're writing short stories, you're sending them out, and you're publishing them in, you know, what to a writer is an amazing like, oh my god, the Iowa Review. But to the general reader, they're not picking that up. That's not. Um, the big time necessarily um, and then uh, stories you know the, the best American short stories is one of those anthologies where they sweep through all of those literary journals and select certain ones and um, that you know even just the first time that happened I mean that was the biggest thing that had you know mm -hmm. happened in my career by far um, although you, you did happening. have you did have stunningly early success as a short story writer what your third submission was it that, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and you know certainly I mean, if there, yeah there were several factors that went into that one was just doing you know kind of knowing the literary landscape and having worked at a literary journal and and uh, n you know knowing how much I had to revise I mm -hmm. think that you know I have I've a lot of very, very talented students um, who, you know, the, it, certainly a lot of it is just luck, whether something finds the right home. And, it, and also, have you researched who's, what editor is looking for what kind of thing, what's someone's taste? Um, but also, sometimes that last step is just, do you understand how many times you have to revise this thing? You have to reject it yourself many, many times before you can send it out and let someone else reject it. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, I was very, very, very lucky and I think also just was fortunate to be aware of how much self-rejection had to go on before the work went out into the world. 
I, I'm always in awe of short story writers because in a novel, you can afford a few flaccid pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in a yeah. short story, you can't afford a paragraph that isn't yeah. propulsive. And so, I think about like painting a picture on the head of a pin or something, yeah. you know, just absolutely how do impossible. You, how do you feel about the two different forms? Do you have a favorite? No, I don't. Um, I, you know, I think that I'm very... Uh, I am driven by the story that I want to tell. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, I find, you know, there are always uh, competing stories that I want to tell. One of them kind of becomes more urgent. Um, and some of those are short story sized ideas. They're not things I would want to sustain for 300 pages. They're not something you want to read for 300 pages. Um, maybe it's more experimental. Maybe it's just not a world that I want to live in for that long. And other things are just bigger, deeper topics. I couldn't do that in 9,000 words. I need that 300 page book. Um, but I, I love both forms and I'm, you know, I'm always on the soapbox of, you know, you should, if you're a serious reader, you should be reading short stories um, because they're, you know, the edges of experimentation of what any author is able to do um, are there. And, uh, and you're gonna discover, you know, you pick up one of those anthologies, you're gonna discover so many new writers. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's true. So talking about um, situations, and you, you're always intrigued by a number of them, um, how did the situation at the heart of yeah. I Have Some Questions come to you? Right. Um, so I should do two things. I should kind of explain what that situation is, and then mm -hmm. I should tell you. <laughs> so um, the basic story is that we have a, a woman who's in her, she's 40, she's... Um, uh, film historian, and uh, she is invited back for two weeks to teach a mini course at the boarding school that she herself attended in the 90s in New Hampshire as an adrift scholarship kid. Um, and uh, while she's back there, her mind is, of course, on her own past, but, but very soon, very quickly, on the death of uh, her senior year of a young woman in her class. Um, they weren't friends, but this affected her a lot, and this, this young woman was found dead in the campus swimming pool um, with significant injuries to her body. And very quickly, um, a young black man who worked as an athletic trainer at the school was arrested with what seemed like a mountain of evidence against him, including a confession. He's been in prison. A lot of people believe he's innocent, including one of her students who wants to then do a, a project about this. Um, and she's drawn back into thinking about it, and the book goes from there. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, there, there are several origin points. You think of it, you know, kind of tributaries into the one river. Um, one is I do live on the campus of the boarding school where my husband teaches. Um, some of you might have heard me say this yesterday on a panel, but um, uh, the, the, the short version of the complicated story is I was a day student at a boarding school near Chicago. I left, I graduated, I came out east, I met this guy. Uh, he was a high school English teacher. I dragged him back to Chicago. The place he got the job was my old high school. Um, <laughs> it was supposed to be for three years. It's been 22 years. And uh, so I've lived for 22 years on the campus of my boarding school, although I don't teach there. Um, so it was inevitable that at some point I was going to write a boarding school novel. Um, people would ask me. And it's just, it's a fascinating setting. It's, I think it's fascinating for people to read about if they didn't go to a school like that. And it's fascinating to read about if you did go to a school like that. Um, and it's also a setting that I think people tend to get wrong um, and misrepresent in a lot of ways. There's a little bit of like, I want to tell the real version here. Um, that was going on. I was working on this in the early days of Me Too, which is in many ways, you know, was so much about looking back for so many of us, looking back on high school, looking back on college with a different lens um, that came together with it. Um, and, uh, you know, that idea of looking back, I didn't want to write a YA novel, decided, you know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go there, I'm gonna write an actual mystery. Mysteries are essentially about looking back, what already happened here. How can we interpret what already happened here? Um, and so, that all came together. And it, you have a very powerful protagonist. Can you tell us about Bodhi and how yeah. she came to you? Yeah. Um, She's, uh, right, she's someone, it's interesting, I, I needed someone, I sort of 
you know, I, I, I'm a writer who's, there, there are a lot of writers who start with character. And the character kind of has a voice and speaks to them. And then their job as a writer is how do I push this character into trouble? Um, my, the way that it comes naturally to me is to think first about conflict, the situation, and then to go, okay, who is gonna get themselves into this kind of mess? Um, and kind of reverse engineer the character who's going to be the most affected by this, the most changed by it, get in the deepest. Um, so I needed someone who was going to be very put together and capable as an adult, um, but had been quite adrift as a, as a teenager. Um, so that when she steps back on that campus, she's pulled between those two people. Um, so I have, you know, she's someone who is, you know, she's, she's quite well known as a film historian. She has the successful podcast. She's also kind of in the midst of a divorce. Things are a little wobblier for her. And her husband and, is an artist. Visual artist? Yeah, her husband gets me too while she's there. Um, so things, you know, I'm kind of pulling away all of her foundations as I put her back on this campus. Um, you, your job as a writer is often to torture your character, um, not out of some sadistic, you know, uh, inclination, but you want the character by the end of the story or by the midpoint of the story to be capable of things that they weren't capable of at the beginning, whether those are good or bad. And um, I mean, not 100% not of the time, but it, it, it's a, you know, it's something I always have an eye on. Um, how can I destabilize this person or spur this person into action? Um, so I needed someone kind of simultaneously incredibly capable, uh, but there's a little bit of quicksand still at her foundation. So she's the I in the title. I have some questions for you. The you yeah. does not... It's not evident immediately, right. but tell us about the you. Yeah, and I, I don't feel like this is too much of a spoiler, because I no. think within a few pages you learn, but um, right, there is a you, and it's, it's, you know, it's a first-person book. It's not constant you. It's not like a choose-your-own-adventure you kind of book, but um, there's, there's someone the book is being sort of thought at, addressed to, um, and the, the very minor spoiler is that this is a man who had been a music teacher at the school, um, and one of those people who was just very, very close to the students, who all loved him, but in retrospect, maybe that was creepy. And um, in re you know, the, the rumor at the time had been that he and Thalia Keith, this is the young woman who winds up dead, that they had been involved in some way. And in the intervening years, Bodhi has felt like, well, that was clearly just adolescent rumor, but returns and really starts thinking about it again and going, he should have been investigated, and he wasn't. Um, and so she's, the book is addressed to him, kind of thought at him. Yeah. In the same way that, you know, you, you know, when you return to a place where you, and there's someone who's on your mind, you do kind of think at them, right? Um, and uh, so that, it, it, allowed a, it, it allowed me to make some, some fun narrative choices. There's a wonderful line, I'm going to butcher it, I think, but, um, and I don't think it's a spoiler, but when she says to him in her mind, um, I was incorrect, but I wasn't wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I thought about that because as a journalist, I often thought how something can be accurate, but not true. Right, <laughs> yeah. And I always yeah. thought of a, a, a very trivial example of that was when, um, when my boss was trying to convince us to take a job in Cairo, she said, it comes with an apartment with three bathrooms and a view of the pyramids. <laughs> that was accurate. <laughs> but it wasn't true because none of the bathrooms had working toilets. And yeah. the view of the pyramids I saw precisely once when there was no dust in the air in Cairo. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally, totally. Um, but it's that question of like, like you know, that that it is, you know, it, it is really interesting in in a narrative to examine uh, truth and memory because you know all all that you know about yourself is memory, right? Every I, you're sitting here, everything else you know about yourself is a memory, and then you know, of course, those aren't accurate. Um, of course, they're skewed. Of course, they're subjective. Um, and the stories we tell ourselves, um, I, I love thinking about that connection. You know, my work as a storyteller, your work as a storyteller, um, and how we can make, how we can draw all the questions we tell ourselves into that 
microscope. Yeah, and this, I think at heart, uh, probably the biggest theme that came through to me in this book is about violence against women mm -hmm. in all its forms, mm -hmm. uh, and you really have such a nuanced take on that. But you also have an incredibly brave and nuanced take on the Me Too movements. Mm -hmm. And so there was a kind of a, a feverish, um, I, would, I would characterize it as perhaps an overcorrection. Right. And you get at the heart of this really beautifully when Bodhi's estranged, not entirely estranged, but mm -hmm. you know, the husband that she's breaking up with is Me too over a... A, a transgression that do you mm -hmm. want to just yeah, yeah I can explain yeah, I mean yeah. as say just as background I think um, I think we all had those moments within that Me Too reckoning of seeing you know a case or two where we go oh well not that that's that that's not a you know that that's that's not the same whatever that was for you um, and that line is in different places for different people but you know as we figure out what this all is as the pendulum swings. Are there moments where you go, oh, that's a little too far? Um, and uh, this is, of course, you know, this is a completely fictional one, and it's one that I, I chose because I don't think literally every reader would have the same reaction to it. Um, but it's that her husband, uh, before he was married to her, had a relationship with a woman, I think I said 15 years younger, but she was a, an adult. She was 21. Uh, she was 21, right. Um, she worked for a gallery, he was an up and coming artist. And she is now making an art piece about him and saying this was, you know, uh, clearly, it, it, it's not even what she's saying, it's what other people are saying in response, that this was a, um, a predatory relationship because of the age gap between them. And because he had more power as an artist. Um, and, uh, you know, she, my, you know, my character uh, comes down on, oh, come on, don't be ridiculous. This is not the same. Um, Before you go any further, yeah. can I get you to read this bit? It's, oh, a, sure. it's a little bit hard to read, but it's really worth it, yeah. I think, because you get at the heart of what goes on in a Twitter storm more sure. beautifully. And so this is the scene, just to set it up, is Bodhi's had a few drinks, and <laughs> she makes a mistake of reading what's being said about her ex. Yeah. And she... Just, so first, I can, yeah. first the, the Twitter storm, and then she does that thing that all of us have regretted doing after a few drinks is responds. <laughs> uh <-huh>. so, <laughs> I'm not saying she just, makes good decisions just here. Just start yeah. wherever you want. Okay, yeah. sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, um, she start, she's reading the this thread, um, and the uh, her husband's name is Jerome Wager. Um, so these are kind of tweets. And she's a feminist, you know, she's, right. her podcast is a feminist podcast. Right, so, so the yeah. tweets, let's not forget that Jerome's wager, Jerome Wager's work is terrible plus derivative. He's just one of the many scum men who run the planet. Um, someone then tagging the artist, what Wild Jazz has done is ferocious and brave. If you've been harmed by Jerome Wager, DM me, I will protect your anonymity. Can someone explain to me how Jerome Wager still has a platform? He's still on Twitter and CGR Gallery has made no statement denouncing his actions. This doesn't seem like abuse to me. It seems like a shitty relationship. Are we canceling people now for being bad at dating? It's sad this has to be... Sorry, I'm skipping a couple of those. Oh, no. It, um, it's sad this has to be explained to you. Lording power over someone, even soft power, is structural imbalance. Abuse does not have to equal rape. Still no statement from Ms. Bodie Kane, and that's her. Hello at Starlet Pod, her podcast. Even if Jerome Wager faces repercussion, the damage is done. How many gallery shows should have gone to other people? How much money has he made wielding his power and keeping others down? We have one law in this country about the age of consent, and it's the age of 18. Someone 18 can screw someone 100, and I'm sorry, but it's perfectly legal. <laughs> Actually, in some places it's younger, but this is not about the age of consent, you absolute dingbat. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, I don't know if you, I mean, that's, that's no, the story. No, you want me yeah, to keep? I'd, I'd like you to. Yeah, yeah, I'll go. Okay, so yeah, yeah. I'll skip ahead. She's basically saying, you know, kind of feeling like, you know, drunk and anger that, you know, what he did is not as bad as what she's looking back right now on high school and, and thinking about actual abuse. So I typed out a thread of messages with my pruning thumbs. She's in the bathtub. Posting each after a quick scan for drunken typos. <laughs> Has Jasmine Wilde even asked for repercussions? This is a work of art, not, as far as I know, a call to action. 
I'm no longer with Jerome Wager, but as a survival of actual sexual assault, this all sits wrong with me. Age is not the only form of power. You could argue that working for the gallery, Jasmine had as much power over him as he had over her. Are we talking about the feminism of empowerment or the feminism of victimhood? Either a 21-year-old woman is an adult who can make her own decisions or a helpless waif who needs our protection against big, scary men. Which is it? It can't be both. Are we saying a 20-year-old woman, 21-year-old woman lacks sexual agency, lacks the ability to make decisions about her own body? Whose permission does she need to date someone older? Her father's? This is infantilizing. What age range would be acceptable to all of you? Is five years older okay? Is one year older okay? One month? That said, Jasmine has created an evocative piece of art. Let's leave it at that. Art, not a call for the Twitter mob. I stopped myself because my blood pressure was only going up and I hadn't run any of this by Jerome and there were already replies coming in that I didn't want to read. <laughs> I managed not to slip on the floor, managed to make it to the bed. <laughs> Things do not go well after that. <laughs> I just want to I just want to uh, raise one more important theme in this book before we open it up to questions. I've yeah. hoped way too much of the time, but... This book is really powerful on the absolute brutalities of the carceral system and its structural mm. racism. Yeah. And uh, it's a very, very important theme in the book and you handle it brilliantly. And you also wrote, before the book came out, I think the best essay I have read on uh, the fraught business of writing the other. Yeah, that actually, I actually published that before The Great Believers came out, my previous oh, book. That's um, right. That's because, right. which is yeah, about yeah, the yeah. AIDS epidemic in Chicago. So it was very much about, you know, uh, about, uh, you know, the ethics and considerations involved in representing someone else, especially someone with less structural power. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, less of, you know, The Great Believers was was very much about, you know, the AIDS epidemic. This book is about the carceral system, but it's not the main topic of the book. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, uh, you know, as the book goes on, she becomes more and more aware of the plight of this man who's been convicted. Um, and it becomes, you know, you know, within the second half of the book, becomes centralized. Um, there was, you know, I, I think I, you know, I stand by that same essay in terms of, and some, some of you were at the uh, uh, panel I was on yesterday where we talked about this, but the, the legwork involved um, in doing your research and, and, you know, thinking deeply about why am I doing this to begin with, um, and then, you know, interviews, research, et cetera. Um, I, I spoke, uh, I did speak to people who'd been incarcerated. That was one thing. I also... Um, you know, so many. It's so, it would be so easy to kind of just fudge the legal system, and you know, any TV show you watch does that. They make it much more dramatic, and I just was not interested in doing that. So I, I spent a lot of time with um, this wonderful public defender from New Hampshire, just the intricacies of specifically New Hampshire appellate law, um, which I knew nothing about. I still know nothing about other than what's in the book. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, making sure. You know, am I? Am I? really doing the work to represent this um, rather than grabbing this for my own uses as a plot device. Okay, so I think, um, does anybody have questions for Rebecca? Yes. Uh, could you come to the microphone? That would be great. <laughs> that was a joke. Um, First of all, congratulations. You're obviously a, a, a joy to read. And, Thank you. Um, many people here, I'm sure, have followed your career. I am new to your work, so I just finished your, your book that's up there. Uh, but I would love to get your thoughts on what advice you would give to people who are looking to become writers oh, of yeah. fiction, especially those that are on the precipice of publishing their first book, self-publishing, I might okay. ask, which okay. is probably a whole different space than, than you're in, I understand, yeah. but still would love to get your advice. Yeah. This is, you know, so much of what I do, I, you know, I, I, I did, I love teaching, and so some, you know, um, I, I still love teaching writing, and I love, you know, working with writers who are developing and getting to that place of the first book or the first story. Um, so, you know, God, I mean, that's that's a very broad question, of course. Um, I would say in terms of people who are, you know, just approaching fiction writing, who are interested in it, 
Um, there are so many resources out there for learning um, that are outside of academia. I think there's, you know, people can worry that they need to enroll in an MFA program, and there are so many incredible places that um, she read in my bio. I, I run a place called Story Studio Chicago that's a nonprofit writing arts center. Um, for New Englanders, there's Grub Street in Boston. A lot of these places, including, I think all of them have gone online because of, you know, COVID and then have stayed there partly. So there's so many resources for really, you know, serious study of a serious craft. Um, and then, uh, God, um, you know, the publication thing, I would say the, the, you know, one of many things I tell you is the best thing you can do to protect your mental health is start your next book now. So that no matter what someone says about the previous book, you'd be like, oh yeah, that was my last book. Next one's going to be great. <laughs> Jace? Yeah. Um, I was wondering, so I play quite a few instruments and I know bits and pieces of a few languages and I, you know, I know this was like all the way at the beginning, but yeah, I, yeah. I wanted to ask like, how do you think, m like more on how do you think that music and writing, storytelling are connected yeah. and additionally, how do you think that music has affected your writing style? That's a great question. Um, yeah, my, my story collection is actually called Music for Wartime. And it's um, a lot of the stories in there about music, musicians, kind of the confluence of art and, you know, and, you know, how do we make art in the middle of a pretty brutal world? Um, so I would say, you know, there, the, I think most specifically, music, you know, as, as it's a matter of the ear, is relating to just you know the the sounds on the page. Um, am I you know can I write a sentence not just that you know, it's not about sounding pretty, but can I write a sentence that ha it, have I do I hear the rhythm of my own sentence? Can I find the tension of my own sentence, the momentum of my own sentence? Um, and you know do, I I will you know especially especially at the end of something where I think sound matters the most, I will literally be banging out the rhythm on a table. Um, and this is prose, this isn't poetry. Uh, but that, that matters to me hugely, and I think it's something that you know, people can learn just as they can learn to have a better ear in music. Um, but you know, when someone has that naturally, that's awesome. Um, I also think that you know, when you think about, if, if you've studied music seriously or you play music seriously, you think about those lines of tension and release throughout a piece. Um, you know, where, where am I building up? Where's a moment of respite? You know, how long can some, can I sustain tension? Um, very similar to, you know, how do you hold the attention of a child? Um, how do I hold someone's attention musically? How do I, how do I keep this, this, uh, momentum through a piece? Um, it's not something that I'm, I'm not sitting there thinking actively about music when I write. Um, but I do think that a training in music is helpful that way. Um, I would imagine that you know people who have backgrounds in other things would say, you know I would imagine that someone could say you know their background in basketball helped them enormously as a writer, um, or or whatever, or swimming or whatever it is. Um, but it's you know you take the things that you know and you find the ways that they're relevant um, to the thing you're making. I think uh, that's the yeah. best thing about being a novelist, actually, because anything you've done, yeah, is prep. Yeah, you know, you don't have to have mastered the periodic table, or you yeah, know, you don't have to have um, dexterity with tools. Whatever you've done, yeah. Is, well, is and I can tell you from various karaoke nights, at various writers' conferences, <laughs> I know a lot of seriously tone deaf writers. Oh my! <laughs> who are yes. nevertheless brilliant writers. Right. <laughs> Um, we we never circled back to the Cheetos accusation. The Cheetos, oh my God, this is so <laughs> funny. Yes. So I was writing about this. I have a sub stack. Um, I was oh, it's a wonderful my... sub stack. Oh, Max you. stack. You have to check it yeah, out. Yeah, su sub Max. So S-U-B-M-A-K-K. Sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh no, it's fine. But, um, <laughs> sub Max. Uh, I was writing, I just thought this was very funny. I got this irate email from a reader um, that said, and it took me so long to figure out what she was saying. She said, I can't, you know, how dare you sell out to Cheetos? A writer of your, you know, caliber, whatever, is nothing sacred anymore. And I went, what is she talking about? <laughs> and I finally realized there's one scene in my novel where a character eats Cheetos. And I think, I, I put it together, she thought that that was sort of like a corporate sponsorship <laughs> that I had put Cheetos in my novel. If, if only it was that easy. Oh my God, <laughs> we'd be making so much money. Just like, oh, and he drove a Jeep and they wear Rolex. And, um, but 
I, you know, and I, I'm, she's thinking, I think, certainly, you know, like, yeah, if it were a reality, if it's The Bachelor and someone's eating Cheetos, yeah, they probably paid for that. But good God, they're not coming. Can you imagine the Frito-Lay meeting where they're like, let's ask this literary <laughs> novelist to put Cheetos in one scene of this novel? <laughs> um, so I, uh, that cracked me up. I, I wish, I wish it were. That, I, I would take Cheetos money. Why not? I would <laughs> get in bed with Frito Lay. <laughs> if there are any more questions, this is your chance. One we have more. One there. Yeah. Two more. Okay. And that'll probably be. Yeah, that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. I just want to say that I lived for 24 years in boarding schools, and ah. I was also the dean of students in one. So I do want to congratulate you because you. I feel that uh, it was very convincing, your, uh, your sense of what that life is like. Uh, but it also seemed to me that it's almost a character. Mm -hmm. The boarding school is sure. almost a character in this novel. There's that closed system. Do you think it... Talk about, you live on a boarding school yeah. campus. Both my children are boarding school teachers, so I'm sure I oh, yeah. emphasize that life in my reading of your novel more perhaps than you meant it to be. But yeah, it feels unhealthy in a way, a uh, very closed system. You could mm. live on a submarine or, <laughs> or a, you know, a, a monastery and right. have that same sort of closed system. But talk about how that influenced characters and how yeah. you see that sure. mystery and everything in, in boarding school. Yeah, I'll say that one you know, one aspect of that that I can answer easily is it was really interesting to me to have these memories of 1995, but also she's there in 2018. And the differences, I, I gave her my high school graduation year just to make things culturally easier. 1995, I graduated. I got my first email account on my first day of college in the fall of 95. So this was kind of, you know, high school was pre-internet, college was internet. And um, this is, you know, the, the boarding school that I'm depicting is particularly remote. There's really nothing else there. Um, so there would be this isolation. And then there's also just, you know, some of the cultural things of the 90s that we, we thought we were so progressive in the 90s. And then you look back and go, oh my God. Um, but the rape culture on campuses in the 90s, the um, the sexism, the racism on campus in the 90s. Um, and I'm not portray portraying the 2018 campus as perfect, but it was very fun and interesting for me to juxtapose those two and to write in 2018 about students who were almost painfully self-aware, right? They think, they overthink everything, but have, you know, uh, have a very different uh, connection to the world um, and a lot more resources uh, and and it's and it's less claustrophobic. And the, um, the, yeah. so idealistic and they, yeah, you know they're gonna they're gonna save us. Right, right. We have one more, and then I think we're gonna yeah. have to wrap. This might be quick. How do you come up with the names of your characters? Oh. They're so they were not typical names. They yeah, that's why I, I actually just wrote a Substack post about naming characters. I love naming characters. Um, I, I really don't feel like I have a handle on my character until I know the name. Um, and when I find the right name, then it's like, oh, that's it, I, I know this person. Um, I think, you know, they need to be slightly memorable. They need to be, you know, just a little bit different. You're not gonna put a Dan and a Dave and a Doug in the same book, you know, things like, those are all great names, but not for the same book. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I think names, I think names have power. I think we, you know, um, I don't imagine that many of us in this tent are necessarily from a culture that literally believes in spiritual power of names, but there absolutely are cultures that do. And I think that, that there's some truth there. They're really, um, if nothing else, they're just such deep linguistic connotations to a name that that carries its own power. Well, give it up for the name, Rebecca. <laughs> Aw, thank you. Thank you so much to both Rebecca and Geraldine for this wonderful session. Rebecca will be available to sign.